We're going to uh, talk about uh, Fort Do Henry and Fort Donaldson. Now, the victor of Fort Donaldson will be the first major step this man we we're going to talk about, Ulysses S. Grant, that'll lead him to general-in-chief of the Army. And the man who arguably has his greatest day, because it sums it all up, when he meets Robert E. Lee in the Wilmer McLean parlor at 3.30 in the afternoon on Palm Sunday of April 1865. Now, if you were evaluating him, I think you would not expect him to be the man who would play militarily wise our one of our greatest generals in chief, Ulysses Simpson Grant. Born in Point Pleasant, Ohio, in 1822, on April 29th, a graduate of West Point in the class of 1843. Number 21 in the class of 1843, of which William Buell Franklin, and I wish I could have thought of that title, that my friend Mark Snell thought of for his biography of William Buell Franklin from first to last. So Grant is from 21st to first. Uh, Grant has a good break at West Point. He was christened Hiram Ulysses Grant. He was called Yuli at home. And the congressman Hamer, who gave him the promotion, uh, the appointment, thought he was named, his first name was Ulysses, since he was called Yuli at home, and assumed uh, since his first, the practice generally in those days was to name the first son with the uh, maiden name of his mother. So he is Ulysses Simpson Grant, but he's entered in West Point as Hiram Ulysses Grant. And Grant will tell us he doesn't like to make a scene, so he doesn't approach the authorities and tell them that Congressman Hamer made a mistake. And my name is Ulysses, uh, is, is Hiram Ulysses Grant. He says, think of when his clothes were stenciled. And as he would tell us in his memoirs, it would be H-U-G. And he was worried that he would be called Hug Grant. A man who was known as the best horseman in the seven classes that graduate or go to West Point while he's there. He has a reputation of being the best horseman of any of the seven classes that will be at West Point during his years there. So he goes to the 4th Infantry instead. And will serve as in uh, the Mexican War. And he is impressed with two officers. He is impressed with Zachary Taylor. He likes Zachary Taylor's low-key approach. Zachary Taylor's choice of uniforms. Because we've got to remember that Ulysses S. Grant, when he meets Robert E. Lee in Wilmer McLean Parlor, is dressed except for the three stars on his shoulder, is dressed in a private uniform, carrying binoculars, no sword. 
And he's impressed equally with General Scott, who is the opposite of Jackery Taylor in his uniform and appearance. Arguably the handsomest soldier in the world at the time of the Mexican War. But he's impressed with Scott's schemes and his strategic vision. And he will, and he has a good job in the Civil War. Besides being Captain Sam, a company commander in the 4th Infantry, he is the regimental quartermaster. That's ideal, because Grant learns to understand logistics on the very elementary level of the company quartermaster. Something that people don't realize that. Grant, of course, will marry after going to West Point and will be sent to California first, then to Fort Vancouver, leaving his wife and two children back in St. In in Louis County. And at the end of his year in 1854, when he gets his evaluation, he comes before Captain Robert Buchanan, the man who kicked the door down at Molino del Rey. And he finds Ulysses Captain Sam Grant wanting. And he will tell Captain Sam, I think you would be well advised to resign from the army. Or if you do not, I will have you, uh, I will have you uh, up before a board. Uh, we will examine your drinking and your gambling. Grant will resign from the army. And, rather strange as we go with our story, he'll reach New York City dead broke and will borrow money to get back to St. Louis from a person he knew as a cadet at West Point, Simon Bolivar Buckner, who was a class of 1842, much better acquainted with, Fred, uh, with, uh, with, with Cadet Dent, who was Grant's future brother-in-law. So Grant will be able to return the favor to Simon Bolivar Buckner on the 16th day of February, 1862. Uh, Grant has an unhappy life, a failure in a numerous occupation, and is living in Galena, working for his younger brother, who will prove a big pro problem to President Grant when Grant is President of the United States. That's his younger brother, Orville. And uh, Grant will, will immediately, with the firing on Fort Sumter, will see the rapid rise of a man who ended number two in the class of 1846. Of course, uh, Grant would have been a first classman when Cadet McClellan reports for duty. McClellan has a meteoric rise, going from captain to major general of volunteers. And Captain Sam catches a train for Cincinnati sends in his calling card, and sits there the rest of the day waiting for Major General George B. McClellan to call him in. But he sees the name, and an army with less than a thousand, with a thousand officers are natural gossips. And he could remember why Captain Sam resigned from the army. There's this common gossip in the army. 
and he has to go home. One more episode of Captain Sam, and then we'll get to Donaldson. Captain Sam will be given to be a mustering officer with no rank for Governor Dick Yates of Illinois and every regiment that can't shape up. So Governor Yates will use his influence and Captain Sam will become Colonel Sam and will be soon at Annabel, Missouri. And he's sent forward with a reinforced regiment, and he spends a lot of time in his memoirs. As they march east westward and reach the Palmyra area, there's a, there's a Missouri State Guard force in front of him, commanded by General Harris. And Grant can't bring himself to order an attack. When he goes forward the next morning, he finds the Missouri State Guard has fled. They've abandoned their position. And Grant realizes now, when you have the lonely position of commanding officer, the other officers are kind of nervous too. And Grant will never again. And that's what Sherman says when they ask him one time, Who's the best general, you or Grant? Grant is dead. And Sherman will go through every reason, intellectual, and every way he can think of that he is a better general than Grant. And I can see the newspaper people taking it down, eating it up. And Grant Sherman will end up, he'll say, but Grant doesn't worry what the enemy is doing. And I sure as hell do. And that makes General Grant a better general than I am. Well, he is going to soon end up promoted to Brigadier General on the last day of July, 1861, and will be at a good place at the proper time. He'll be in command of the, uh, of the Southern District of Illinois, with headquarters at Cairo, Illinois. When the Confederates make a blunder, Kentucky is trying to maintain its neutrality. And, that, and uh, between them, Gideon Pillow and uh, Bishop Polk will send troops into Kentucky to occupy Ickman and Columbus, and Grant will trump them, because when the Confederates arrived there on the 3rd of September, U.S. Grant seizes a more important point than Columbus or Hickman. It is Paducah, Kentucky, at the mouth of the Tennessee River two miles downstream from the mouth of the Cumberland. And the Cumberland and the Tennessee flow for some 75 miles with a narrow neck of land between them, now known as the Land of Lakes. And the, Confed the, Missouri and the Tennesseans, even before they become officially part of the Confederates, have laid out two forts, particularly the one, Henry, on the Tennessee. The engineer is not very good and doesn't look at the trees and see the high water mark on the trees. And that will become Fort Henry. And 10 miles from it, on the Cumberland River, or the Cumberland which has been flowing from north well, from generally from east to west, turns and flows 70 miles northward to empty into the Ohio River. They'll uh, locate, uh, locate Fort Donaldson. Uh, Lincoln will, uh, the army will win an argument in, 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 in 
last of April, 1861, when they're deciding whether to build an inland navy. And Secretary of War Simon Cameron, definitely not one of the great secretaries of war, will win the argument with the president refereeing the argument between he and Father Neptune, Gideon Wells. And the president will decide, in his logic, inland waterways falls under jurisdiction of the army. So up until the 15th day of October 1862, the Inland Navy will be under administrative control of the Army. Then Grant will make a good use of his partnership with the Uncle Sam's <coughs> web feed. As we, uh, of course, Grant will fight a battle at Belmont at the end of the first week in November of 61, and is lucky to escape capture or maybe his life, with his life. But as we go into, no, uh, into early uh, January, uh, General Halleck, who would, as Lincoln will later say, is a damn good clerk not a good general-in-chief, is Grant's boss up in St. Louis. And Grant learns from, his, from the gunboats, which are now becoming operational, that the Tennessee River is very high, and Donald and Henry is being threatened by water, being flooded out. And Grant will pressure, will come up with a scheme and that the, the gunboats are now ready. Remember, they're under administrative control of the Army, not under, they're officered by Navy personnel, but they're under administrative control. And the gunboats are ready to operate. And uh, Grant will be interesting to move. Now remember, when Lincoln issues his special order as commander-in-chief, that's one of Grant's strong points. He knows the difference between a general-in-chief and the commander-in-chief. This will be almost four weeks, three weeks actually, before Lincoln issues his special order uh, as commander-in-chief that he wants all Union armies to be in motion on, the 20th, on Washington's birthday, the 22nd day of February. McClellan will find a reason he can't do it. But U.S. Grant will already have jumped the gun on the third day of February. Now the Confederate commander in the West is Jeff Davis's favorite general. Don't think that Robert E. Lee is Jefferson Davis's favorite general. It is Albert Sidney Johnston, a man who Davis has admired since Davis was 10 years old and Johnston was 16 years old. So Johnston is in command of Confederate forces with a mission all but impossible, defending a Confederate defense line that begins at Cumberland Gap, passes through Bowling Green, passes through Henry and Donaldson, passes through Columbus, Kentucky, then known as the Gibraltar of the West and on to the neither regions of southwest Missouri. And Grant will 
lobby successfully to get Halleck to agree to let him move against Fort Henry. Was it defended by a fort with 17 guns? It is located on the east bank of the river, and the water is rising rapidly. The Confederates, too late, are erecting a fort across the river on high ground, Fort Hyman. And on the third day of February, Foot, Flag Officer Foot, with four ironclads and three timberclads, and Grant with uh, a force of two divisions, about 15,000 men, leaves Cairo, Illinois, ascend the Ohio River, up the Tennessee River, and land near just below Panther Island, six miles downstream from Fort Henry, and at 17 guns. Grant will make a reconnaissance of the river, and uh, will have his plan. His plan is simple. Grant has now been reinforced by a second division under his old commandant at West Point, Charles Ferguson Smith. And uh, he will advance, he will be put ashore on the Kentucky side of the river and will advance south on Fort Hyman and General McClernand, a political general with his division, with Grant looking over his right shoulder, will march up the east side of the river. The river is high. Foot will, ch will, will somewhat chide Grant. When Grant says, we'll start at 10 o'clock, your gunboats will start at 10 o'clock, and Foot correctly predicts, I will beat you there, and I will take, or, and I will silence the guns and be there when you arrive. So the gunboats head up the river, the four ironclads leading the way, passing by the, between the Kentucky shore and Panther Island and deploy, fighting with their bows on, the four ironclads, foot flying his flag from Cincinnati. Commanding the Essex is one of the more disagreeable men in the Navy, David Dixon Porter's half-brother, Dirty Bill Porter, who handles the truth very recklessly. <laughs> and the gunboats will close, Essex will be knocked out of action, and Cincinnati will close to within a quarter of a mile, and General Tillman, who's pulled off his coat, helping man the guns of Taylor's battery. The fort is almost, uh, water is already beginning to pour into the port, and Fort Henry falls. The troops arrive. The men from Fort Hyman are evacuated successfully, and except for Taylor's battery, the enlisted personnel and office, uh, the, the, all retreat to Fort Donaldson. Now, Grant, what does Grant do? You can imagine what the president must think. His message to uh, the Halleck and to the War Department, where McClellan is general in chief, that he has captured Fort Henry and will move against Fort Donaldson to, on the 8th. Think of a general saying that. Well, Grant isn't as good as he said he will, because the gunboats have taken a good pounding, 
and three of them have to return of the ironclads to Cairo for repair. Well, Corundalet and the three timber clads head up the Tennessee River, destroying the great bridge at Danville that carries a railroad linking Bowling Green by way of Clarksburg, Clarksville with Memphis, Tennessee. And the gunboats go up the night draft, the timber clads go up the river all the way to Florence, Alabama. Finally, there's a lot of uh, pro-Union people in that rugged hill country, carry dismay and capturing vessels. Grant has been delayed till the 11th. Pretty good general at that. He's missed his deadline for moving against Henry, I mean, against Donaldson from the 8th to the 11th. It is, a, it is an early spring. Most of Grant's, the gunboats have seen action, but the army has seen very little except for the fighting at Belmont back on the seventh day of November. So when Grant moves out of Fort Henry, late on the 11th, traveling the Telegraph Road will be C.F. Smith's division. Traveling the Ridge Road will be General McLaren. And Grant is moving on Donaldson with a force of 15,000 men. The Confederates have now made a terrible blunder. They have decided they're going to, they've got to hold Donaldson. They've already decided we've got to abandon Bowling Green. So the Confederates are throwing reinforcements into Donaldson. Donaldson consists of a water battery, two of them, an enclosed fort, and with the troops pouring in, they now have 16,000 men. Think of General McClellan advancing with 15,000 men on a Confederate force that totals over 16,000 men. They've thrown up a three-mile perimeter around uh, uh, the water battery and the fort, but the Confederates have not, are not very careful about who they send there. For a few moments, Donaldson is a key to the war in the West. If Johnston doesn't go there, he should send General Hardy. But he will send General Buckner. Unfortunately, Grant's old classmate is junior to the two other men that arrived there. The other two men will be Gideon Pillow. Now Gideon Pillow, Grant remembers well, as all regular army men do, because although he was not a law partner of President Polk, like too many people write, he knew the president well. And the president will, uh, he'll use this connection and Worth, Pillow will support General Worth as the armies battle with a pen after the Mexican War. And Scott is a poor match for Worth and Pillow in a court, a court of inquiry at Frederick that fortunately has not ended their, their jurisdiction when Polk leaves the White House. So, Pillow, the story is that Pillow uh, threw up some earthworks the wrong way. Then will arrive even a, another man, even the highest ranking man in Fort Donaldson will be, and the last one to arrive, he'll arrive on the morning of the 13th of February, 
and that is James, John Buchanan Floyd, arguably the worst Secretary of War we've ever had, not a very good governor, and the commander of the Confederate forces there. The only resistance Grant finds is on the 12th. It's from a lowly lieutenant colonel, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, as they skirmish on the road in. And by the evening of the 12th, imagine it, 15,000 men partially investing a fortified position in which there are over 16,000 Confederates. Donaldson is partially invested by the evening of the 12th. There's a flurry of activity on the 13th. Also, the weather has proved unpredictable. Most of the Union soldiers, except the ones that have been at Belmont, are not veterans. And the blossoms are on the trees. So many of them leave, throw away their overcoats, leave behind their shelter halves. And by the evening of the 13th, the temperature is beginning to drop. On the 13th, there are two attacks. On the Union left, where C.F. Smith is located, Lauman's Brigade, largely Iowa, and Cook's Brigade will attack the Confederate fortification, guarding the Confederate right. They will be repulsed, as will Colonel Morrison, who reports to General McLaren, will attack the Confederate battery on high ground known as Maney's Battery, and the Union will be repulsed. And you get your first thing of somewhat friendship because the moisture is not coming down and the ground in front of the horrible works catches fire of the leaves and, and Hyman's men wave a flag of truce and go out and rescue the Union threatened, wounded who are threatened of being incinerated. Well, the gunboats have arrived. The, kind of the Carondelet had arrived on the 13th. While those demonstrations are taking place, Carondelet comes up river, commanded by Commander Watt, opens fire with their bow guns, boom, boom, boom. The Confederate lower battery opens fire. Lieutenant Dixon is killed. One of the Confederate guns in the lower battery, there originally were nine, is knocked out. So, uh, the next day is Easter Sun, uh, is Valentine's Day. And the compress is covering it well, because all quiet on the Potomac. Nothing watching, uh, McClellan is doing nothing. The Western press is there. And the gunboats are going to try to, for their second victory. This time, the Confederate water battery, the lower battery, is about 40 feet above the river. The upper battery is about 20 feet above the river, and the whole you would have to have in a flood of Noah's Ark potential to ever flood them out of Fort Donaldson. And the gunboats stand up river. Foot in St. Louis on the right, as they take position and start the river. Louisville on St. Louis' left. Pittsburgh on, Lu Saint, on Louisville's left, and Carondelet on the closest 
to the other shore. For a while, as they hurl iron valentines, and I'm not a newspaper man, that's how they're describing it. And the Confederate gunners stand tall. Fortunately, the Cumberland flows north, or the Confederates would have probably had them three ironclads, because three of them are badly damaged, and Foote will receive the wound that'll send him to the great beyond later on. Forrest, even Forrest, for a while thinks the gunboats are going to prevail. And he turns to the fighting preacher, Major Kelly, and say, pray, Major Kelly, because only God can save her now. But the time, but it is now, the temperature is 20 above zero. It's turned cold on Valentine's Day. And the snow has fallen. And the Confederate cheers will ring up as the feared and dreaded gunboats are turned back. Well, the Confederates decide in a meeting uh, in the Rice House, the four generals decide we're going to break out of Fort Donaldson. We realize if we stay here, we will soon be completely invested and forced to surrender. Grant decides he's got to go and talk to Foot. His foot's been wounded, so he's going to the landing, six miles downstream from the water batteries. And he leaves orders. He's been reinforced. Grant's force is now 26,000 men. The Confederates, 16,000. But remember, for the first two days, Grant is outnumbered. The new division is commanded by Lew Wallace, and it will be in the center. Smith on the left, Wallace in the center, McLaren on the right. McLaren will be in the eye of the hurricane, because if the Confederates evacuate, it will have to be via the Charlotte Road, which will take them across Lick Creek and on to Nashville. Grant has left, and his orders are, do not bring on an engagement today. I'm going to find out how long it's going to take foot to repair his gunboats and come back upstream. But the Confederates launch a surprise attack. But they haven't coordinated very well. Normally, Pillow is aggressive. Buckner is cautious. And Floyd's the type of man you don't want in command, who will be listening to the last man that talks to him. <laughs> Things start off good for the Confederates as they sally forth. They have massed most of their men except for the men holding the enclosed works under Colonel Bailey and Colonel Head in the 30th Tennessee holding the breastworks uh, overlooking the Eddyville Road. And the Confederates, by 8 o'clock, are driving the Federals back. MacArthur's brigade, which has been shifted from Smith on the extreme left to the extreme right, is soon falling back. General Logan, Colonel Logan is distinguishing himself before he's wounded as Oglesby's brigade begins to give way. The Confederates now become overly encouraged 
The road to Charlotte is open across Lake Creek. But now, fellow, uh, now Buckner begins to see maybe we can really hurt the Federals. Wallace will send in one of his brigades as, as W.H.L. Wallace falls back. Cross men come up, fire into the rear of Wallace's men, and the Union continue to fall back. And the Confederates are forcing McClernand's men back into Bufford Hollow, and the Winds Ferry Road is opening up as we get toward around 10, uh, 11, 1030. Grant has been meeting with Foot. Foot's told Grant, I'll leave one ironclad with you, Louisville, and return to Cairo and repair my vessels and get back in five days. Grant says, good. But now Grant begins to hear the distant roar of artillery. And it sounds like it's coming closer. So Grant, accompanied by several staff officers, mount their horses. And as they ride toward Mrs. Crisp's house, where his headquarters were, they begin to see frightened soldiers coming toward them. With a look of Lee Harvey Oswald in their eye. <laughs> as, as Grant, about noon, reaches W.H.L. Uh, reaches C.F. Smith, his old commandant of cadets from West Point. The commandant is the one you don't want to know. because He's a man that the superintendent isn't a problem. It's a commandant's a problem. And he's going to tell Smith to have your men ready in case I decide to order a counterattack. Wallace ri uh, Lee, uh, Grant rides on. Now they're having a big dispute among the Confederates. Pillow says, we've opened up the Winds Ferry Road. We've got the Charlotte Road open. I think we can, we've got them whipped. We'll go back into the Donaldson perimeter and pick up our gear, our knapsacks. We'll also pick up Bailey's men and take him with us and march out. Uh, Buckner says, I think we have them on the ropes. Let's keep the offensive going. And Pillow and Floyd vacillates. As he hears from Pillow, he agrees with Pillow. Then he hears from, to talk, to, uh, uh, talk to Buckner, and he goes with Buckner, and well, he can't S or get off the pot, Grant has arrived. And he notices a number of the Confederates, have, uh, particularly in Brown's Brigade, have their rations with them. And he notices they're beginning to pull back. And he goes to Wallace and says, I want you to counterattack the enemy. I think they're about ready to withdraw. He then rides back and sees C.F. Smith and orders C.F. Smith to attack the rebel right. By this time, Brown's brigade, which had been drawn from the Confederate right, is hastening their way back. As C.F. Smith prepares to counterattack and orders to Grant. He's going to place himself between two battalions of the second Iowa. And uh, he's a rather fierce looking fellow and they're going to advance. And they're gonna come against the part of the Confederate line held by the 30th Tennessee armed prisoner with shotguns. Three color bearers go down. A guy with the wonderful name of Voltaire, Voltaire Tuambe carries the second Iowa's colors and they seize the outer works. 
as darkness closes in. Now, the Confederates are going to meet. They pull back into the perimeter. They meet in the, dot, dot for, in the Dover Hotel. And in comes Stovepipe Johnson, who's been out reconnoitering, but he doesn't look closely. What he sees, he thinks, as Union pickets is a post and rail fence. He sees campfires around which wounded men have assembled, and he comes back and reports that the Charlotte Road is closed. Forrest says, I don't think it is. I'll go out and look at it. While he's gone, the generals will converse. They will decide that they've lost the will to fight. Freud will decide, since I've got some financial problems I left with the War Department, uh, my uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Clemson has played fast and loose with Indian trust bonds, and I've been rumored I've been I've sat, overstocked the arsenals in the South. He says. I will not surrender my command. And he says, I also want to take my command out. He has two brigades of Virginia troops. I want to take them out. And he'll say to, he says, I yield command. Pillow will say, well, if they hate you the most, they hate me second most. Will you take command and let me leave with my staff? And Buckner says, yes, provided I have not exchanged a flag of truce. At this time, Forrest comes back and storms out and says, I'm taking my third Tennessee, and anybody who wants to go out can go with me. Pillow is ferried across the river on a flatboat. Buckner then calls for pen and pencil and will address a communication. Now he knows who the Union commander is. And he will point out that through circumstances other than his own, the command has been passed to him by Lloyd and Buckner, by Floyd and Pillow. And he would like to have the appointment of representatives to talk over <coughs> terms for the possible surrender of Fort Donaldson. Meanwhile, you can really hate Floyd. 600 reinforcements arrive. They file off the boat. They're going to leave them here to be surrendered. So Floyd can evacuate his brigade of troops, his two brigades of troops. So the message is sent to the line under a flag of truce, received by Captain Cosby. Cosby will take it to Buckner. Uh, we'll take, we'll take, uh, Cosby will uh, take it through, take it to pass it through the lines. It'll arrive at Grant's headquarters. Grant will write out his, that the only terms that will be accepted are an immediate unconditional surrender. U.S. Grant. It passes through the lines. Buckner is shocked by it, but confronted by no other alternative, he will decide that he will have to accept these ungracious terms that Grant has given him. 
So the Confederates, 13,000 strong, with 58 cannon, will be surrendered unconditionally to general, to the Union forces. The first great victory in the Civil War. And Sam Grant now becomes unconditional surrender Grant. Think if he'd kept his name, his Christian name, Hug Grant. <laughs> he will offer to lend Buckner some money. And Buckner will be going to Fort Warren. And uh, news will be welcomed in Washington. One bad thing about it is, Grant had never smoked cigars before. But some of the newspaper correspondents will say he likes cigars. And he gets a number of boxes of cigars. They don't know they're sentenced to the poor man to death. Because he's going to die of a very painful type of cancer of the throat. And when the race with just days to spend, with days to spare, as he as he struggles in great pain to complete one of the great military memoirs ever written, the memoirs of U.S. Grant. After the battle, Halleck is an ungrateful prig. As Grant will say it, there is a breakdown in communications out of, uh, out of Paducah to uh, to St. Louis, and Halleck will, and in several days, will send a message to, to General McClellan. Remember, McClellan is still general in chief, and he's going to say that General Grant's men are almost as demoralized by victory as, they are as the enemy are by defeat. I cannot get any reports out of him, and what more, the code word, it's rumored that Grant has resorted to his old habit. That goes to McClellan. Fortunately, Grant has a friend, Congressman Elihu Washburn, who will go to the president and he'll put the pressure on Halleck. And Halleck will re realize uh, that he's bitten off more than he can chew. So we have Grant beginning that first giant step that will bring him to Wilbur McLean's parlor on Palm Sunday, April 14th, excuse me, April 10th, 1865. So that's the beginning of a great man's ascent to greatness. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer. Carl, if I can see you for a minute, please. Who has the first question? Uh, over here, we have one. Repeat it again. You mentioned that Columbus, Kentucky was the Gibraltar of the South. All right. All right, the Battle of Donaldson will have immediate and far-reaching effects. Columbus, Kentucky is evacuated on the third day of, of March. It's evacuated two weeks after Donaldson falls. Bishop Polk, with Beauregard looking over his right shoulder, will fall all the way back to Corinth, Mississippi. The fall of Donaldson will speed the Confederate evacuation of Nashville. 
The Confederates will be out of Nashville by the 25th and 26th of February, falling back to Murfreesboro on a, route, on a march that will take them to Corinth, Mississippi, where the next big uh, battle will take place. So by the fall of Donaldson, the, the Union have broken the Confederate first line of defense out west, including uh, uh, Bowling Green, Knox, uh, Nashville will be, uh, gunboats will proceed up the river as far as Savannah, and uh, the Confederates will fall back to Corinth, setting the stage for the uh, Battle of Shiloh. At the same time out west, uh, Samuel Ryan Curtis will have be beating the Confederates at Pea Ridge in northwestern Arkansas on 6th, 7th, and 8th of March. So uh, that's been a particularly good time uh, for the Union forces out west. Halleck will, Halleck will get one thing out of it. He will message Washington, I gave you, uh, I, I, for Fort Donaldson, give me command in the west. So Halleck's uh, will be given, uh, they'll expand Halleck's department to not only include Grant's army of the Mississippi, but Buell's army of the, of the uh, Ohio and uh, John Pope's army of the Mississippi. So Halleck uh, gets a lot of, uh, lots of uh, good, good things coming out of Grant's victory. So that there was one um, one ironclad left during the battle, did it have any effect, like massive effects or far-reaching effects on the battle? The the one ironclad that uh, remained is serviceable after February 14th. Yep. What further effect did it have? Yes, it has one effect. It will enable uh, the Union uh, to reinforce Buell. Uh, reinforce Buell. Buell's advancing southward from Bowling Green. So Bull Nelson's division of Buell's army will be moved by steamboat up the Cumberland River by Fort Donaldson, by Clarksburg, and will join General Buell at Nashville. So it will be, uh, it'll give the Union control of the Cumberland River as far upstream as Nashville. During the Battle of Fort Donaldson, uh, other than the 600 Confederate reinforcements, reinforcements that arrived, um, what other action was uh, Albert Sidney Johnson doing uh, to interfere and possibly save Fort Donaldson? Johnston is staying with uh, uh, directing the retreat and trying to coordinate the evacuation of Nashville the concentration of Buell's, uh, uh, the concentration of Hardee's men by way of Nashville, Murfreesboro, Decatur, uh, to Corinth, uh, to cooperate, to consolidate it with the withdrawal of uh, uh, Polk and Beauregard as they give up Columbus, Kentucky, uh, and retreat down the Mobile and Ohio Railroad uh, to Corinth. So that uh, is what. Uh, the other activities are falling out of it. Here we have a question in the center, please. Ed, did John Floyd have a price on his head with the federal government for moving supplies south before the war started? Well, uh, uh, would John Floyd suffer any repercussions uh, for both the uh, shortage of uh, the misappropriation of Indian uh, uh, bonds? Of course, he's responsible for it. It's one of his staff that's doing it, but you're responsible for your uh, staff. 
And uh, no, he probably would have been, but he has a heart attack and dies the next year. He never gets another suitable command. Pillow will. Pillow is a, does a good job of uh, being responsible uh, for conscription uh, in the South. He's pretty good at conscripting people. So, but he, uh, he, his fighting days are over because he gets, uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the period of, uh, of uh, operations uh, in Sherman's march to the sea, uh, he'll, uh, excuse me, Sherman's campaign up against Atlanta, he'll be command of a cavalry brigade that's going to dash into Lafayette, Georgia, and not do very good there. So he keeps his record going. General Sherman replaced by General Buell. Uh, Sherman, Sherman uh, has some serious problems. The Federals, Kentucky eats up commanders fast. The first commander that after Kentucky tips to the Union side will be Robert Anderson, who is already in a nervous, uh, somewhat of a nervous wreck from uh, Fort uh, Sumter. Well, he'll have a nervous breakdown. They'll then send Sherman in. Uh, Sherman uh, will uh, not get along with the Secretary of War, Secretary Cameron. Uh, he'll uh, he'll stiff, um, stiff a meeting schedule with uh, uh, Cameron, and then we'll make a statement. It will take an army of 200,000 men to successfully invade the South. Uh, speaking of such numbers, uh, causes uh, grave concerns about Sherman's sanity. So it's going to be decided that it might good be, be a good idea if Sherman went, uh, took, uh, took a sick leave, uh, an emergency leave, uh, went, back, uh, went, went back, to, uh, uh, back to Lancaster, Ohio, uh, be with his father-in-law, uh, I don't know if it's so good being with his wife because uh, they're not really, they have their problems. So he will be relieved of command uh, because of grave uh, uh, reservations sought of his sanity. That'll begin to come uh, crazy, Sherman's crazy, and then Sherman will, uh, uh, will decide if they think I'm crazy uh, during the Vicksburg campaign, uh, he'll accuse uh, Mr. Knox a prominent newspaper man of being a spy, and uh, they're a little worried when he threatens to have him court-martialed and treated as a spy for writing articles uh, of scurrilous articles and giving aid and comfort to the enemy. So yes, he has a nervous break. Probably had a nervous breakdown. Yes, my question is concerning the, the, uh, the prisoners who were taken at Fort Thomas in 13,000, I believe you said. Considering the parole and exchange policies early in the war, I'm just wondering uh, what became of them. Were they paroled? Uh, how soon would they return to action oh. against? Good question. The 13. It's around 13,000 they capture, because a number of them just walk out, including Bushrod Johnson, a general, just goes for a stroll. So the officers, the senior officers, Tillman, uh, Tillman and uh, Buckner, and a number of the colonels, active brigade commanders, uh, to a number of about 150, go to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. The enlisted men and junior officers will, most of the enlisted men will either go to uh, Camp Martin, Camp Chase, or, or Camp uh, Harrison. And there they will remain. They'll remain until 
two months after the signing of the Dix Hill Cartel. In mid sept uh, in mid in mid uh, mid July, both sides are are holding a large number of prisoners. So they decide that since we do not want to recognize the Confederacy, it will be conducted. They'll have a meeting. Uh, in which General Dix will represent the North and General D.H. Hill will represent the South, and they'll come up with a, with a way to deal with prisoners. All prisoners then held at the time of the Dix Hill Cartel will be exchanged. The most of the Donaldson prisoners will be sent from the prison camps where they're held to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and they're exchanged. Most of them will be back in action at the time of the Battle of Corinth, which is the third and the fourth of October, 1862. The other prisoners will be exchanged General in the east, they're changed either at uh, uh, Atlee's, uh, they're changed at Atkins Landing on the James River. So the prisoners will be exchanged at the two places. Then henceforth, if this is a formal surrender or you're captured with a large number, you will then be paroled not to fight again until duly exchanged. The first significant number captured and paroled under the Dix Hill Cartel will be the Harper's Ferry Garrison of roughly 12,000 men, which will, after they make out dual lists, one for the Union, one for the Confederates, of the men paroled, they will then be sent, not home. They think they're going home. Uh, the uh, the uh, Harper's Ferry prisoners think they're going someplace near home, but they're fooled. They're going to send them to the friendly shores of Lake Michigan uh, to Camp Douglas, a former Union camp of instruction, a former Confederate prison fan, and they will remain there until they are paroled and exchanged. The Harper's Ferry prisoners uh, will be exchanged in the late and the early spring of 1863. And they will, the ones that are constitute Willard's Brigade will come back to the, will be uh, reorganized and placed in the Army of the Potomac where they become known, and undoubtedly in a lot of barroom brawls will result. They'll be known to their fellow soldiers in the Army of the Potomac as the Harper's Ferry cowards and will redeem themselves at Gettysburg on July 2nd and 3rd and no longer be called the Harper's Ferry Cowards. So that's how they dealt with it. The Union are going to uh, eventually uh, get out of the uh, exchange and parole. Because one thing, the Confederates are not very bright. When Lincoln makes it a matter of policy to begin organizing USCTs, the Confederates take the position which Lincoln cannot uh, acknowledge. They take the position that, uh, that blacks captured will be returned if you can find out if they're runaway slaves, they go back to Massa to go back to work. But if they're not runaway slaves and they're free men, they will be re re reduced to slavery. The Confederates also threaten that Confederate Union officers commanding black troops will be turned over to the states for prosecution for servile insurrection. Every southern state in the Confederacy has a law against inciting to servile insurrection. So the Union are going to trump them. Who's, who can be the most important man 
if the Confederates are going to be that stupid to turn officers of white units over the states for prosecution for inciting a sort of violent insurrection. The Union will fill out, uh, will conduct a covert operation uh, during the last week of June 1863. They'll send a team through the, uh, send a room up the team up the uh, north side of the Pamunkey River. They'll cross the uh, Pamunkey River and they'll descend on Hickory Hill. Hickory Hill is where Rooney Lee has been sent to recover from his uh, brandy station wound. So that means you've got a son of Robert E. Lee held in Durrance Vile by the Federals, and they will not exchange Rooney Lee till the late spring, till the late winter of 64, to let the Confederate, the Union know if you're going to execute men for servile insurrection, we can, we can play the game with a very high and important man. Next question. Any last, any last question? There's down here in the, in fact, there are two down here in the middle. We'll, we'll wind up with these two. First, uh, uh, Layton is very pleased with uh, this uh, capture of Fort Henry. Uh, Lift your mic up. I'm sorry. Uh, Layton is very pleased with How did McClellan react to the capture of Fort Henry? Well, uh, uh, McClellan probably is, has to be somewhat happy, because remember, he's still general-in-chief until the 10th and 11th of March, 1862. So it's, they do it under his watch, but not very close to under his watch. He's probably wondering, why didn't I maybe, uh, why, why, why did I not talk to him? Why didn't I at least give him the courtesy of an interview, probably be much more important when McClellan is running for president uh, of how far Grant has gone. Early on, you mentioned that, that big line from uh, Cumberland Gap over to the Mississippi River. Uh, whose idea was that? All right, the, the, the first Union success of breaking the Confederate line that goes from Cumberland Gap through the Indian Territory is done by George H. Thomas. I would get myself too involved if I did the Battle of Mill Springs. That occurs on the 19th day of, of January when Thomas with about 4,000 men defeats 4,000 Confederates at the Battle of Mill Springs. Now, the Confederates that Thomas defeats at Mill Springs uh, will, uh, uh, will fall back uh, through Jamestown and join General Johnston's army that is retreating from Bowling Green at Murfreesboro. They'll join it with General Crittenden. Uh, General George Crittenden uh, is going to be... Uh, uh, you don't want George Cretton for your great for your grandfather, because he's going to be relieved by Johnston uh, on the, about two weeks before the Battle of Shiloh because he can't leave the bottle alone. <laughs> Being a good conductor, you can say that he has to uh, hit the bottle a little bit. They'll, he'll nail two of them there for that, Carroll and and Crittenden. So they so they they'll fight they'll fight at. Uh, at Shiloh under the command of, in the wing of the army, commanded by General Breckinridge. Uh, it would be impolitic of me to mention that uh, General George B. Crittenden had formerly been a commandant of Carlisle Barracks. So I forgot <laughs> to say that. You always learn something when you're with Richard. And you always learn something when you hear from him. Let's give him a great round of applause. Gary will take a photo. Okay. Yeah. We'll shake hands. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have some things for you, Ed. I want to mention one thing before the things. 
The best book on Donaldson is when Henry, where the, where the South lost the war. It's by one of your colleagues out at Fort Leavenworth, Kendall, Kendall Gott's the best, best book on it. Thank you, Ed. And we want to present you with this poster of your presentation to symbolize the gratitude that all of us feel for your willingness to, to come here and speak to us tonight. Wonderful. It's wonderful coming to speak to such a knowledgeable, interested group as I had here tonight. Yeah. And because you are such a special person, Ed, we have something special from the historical archives of the Military History Institute that includes over 15 million books, photographs, and manuscripts on military history. We have a copy of this original letter written January the 8th, 1862, handwritten by General Grant to Captain Reuben Hatch, his chief quartermaster at Cairo, and it says, have all the teams you can possibly get together ready for service by tomorrow noon, tying in with the Mayfield expedition that would be a, a prelude to the Henry and Donaldson expedition. Please accept this with I, our gratitude. This is wonderful because I know more than I want to know about Reuben Hatch. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Reuben Hatch was cashiered for cooking the books. <laughs> you don't cook the books by throwing them in the Ohio River. <laughs> he then, got, then he resigned in a pick, and he is the man that's more responsible than anybody else for putting... 2,200 men on Sultana, which is licensed to carry 300 people. Yes. So he's responsible for 1,700 deaths. So, so that makes it even better yet, because <laughs> I, because he's a, uh, because uh, we all know General Grant, but uh, having. Poor, poor Grant, he's cooking the books while yeah. Grant's writing this letter on him. <laughs> they almost got him there in 62, but he wiggled out. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs>